Let's uh, let's see. I better turn this on. Is that it? Okay. I guess I uh, am of little faith. I only made 70 copies of the little handout that uh, m maybe most of you got, but uh, undoubtedly some did not. Uh, if you are maybe able to sit near someone who has a copy or if husband and wife could share or something like that and make some copies available to, to those who didn't. What I did with the, that sheet is to write out or, or type out every verse that I will use tonight in order so that those who have a hard time keeping up, turning in their scriptures, will have it right in front of them. Um, somebody looked at that sheet and said, how many hours, you know, is this message going to take? And I said, well, if I hadn't typed these verses out, it could take several. That's the reason that I typed them out. Um, before I begin, I want to establish a clear Bible-based definition of an all-important scriptural term, and that is faith. Faith. Why is it so important? Well, at least one verse most people here are well familiar with. Hebrews 11.6. Now, those of you who have copies of the verse list in front of you, I want you to follow along on the list and see, well, just, just pay attention. But without faith, it is very difficult to please him for he that, can, what's that? Impossible. Now, I don't mean to treat you like children, although I have used that, speaking to children, because it's kind of fun for them to catch me. I think we need to make a point of that. What's the difference between very difficult and impossible? One can be done, one can't. Hebrews 11.6 says you can't please God without faith. Moreover, Romans 14.23 says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So just exactly what is faith? A comparison of a couple verses will give us the answer. You have it in front of you, those of you with the sheets. Romans 4.3 says, For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now we drop down to verse 9. Verse 9 says, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Well, if believing God, verse 3, and faith, verse 9, both equal righteousness, then faith equals believing God. I'm an English major. That's a math problem, but I got it right. Amen. Believing God is faith. Faith is believing God. Some teach that Hebrews 11.1 1 defines faith. Actually, it more describes it, assuring us that the Word of God is substantial enough to step out on even when we can't see our way. With that principle established, let's move ahead. What is a person supposed to think or do when confronted with such notable differences in the presentation of the gospel as we hear in our day. For about as long as we can remember, we've heard preachers on every hand declaring that people secure salvation by praying and asking the Lord to forgive and save them in some sort of a, quote, sinner's prayer. The key verse used to give credential to this position, of course, is Romans 10.13. Those of you who have the sheets can read, if you can't quote, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It would be worthy 
worthwhile to go into a discussion of the different uses of the word salvation in Scripture. But trust me that this verse, unless you want to be here for a few hours, this verse does not deal with salvation of the soul. The context makes that clear. On the other hand, while verse 13 might appear that way, on the other hand, verse after verse in Scripture declares that we are saved, de meaning declared righteous before God by faith, meaning by, what was it? Believing God. Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Acts 16.31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. John 3.16, most people in here could quote it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I mean, there are scores of verses we could use. In addition to this second observation, there is another unsettling but undeniable fact. Since the empowerment of the church by the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, there are only three detailed accounts in Scripture of individuals being saved in direct response to a personal presentation of the gospel. Acts 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts 10, Peter and Cornelius. And Acts 16, Paul and the Philippian jailer. Not only were none of these salvation prospects instructed to pray any kind of prayer, neither did any of them pray of their own initiative. You'd think out of three accounts, I understand that not every detail of every incident is recorded in Scripture, but you would think if, if a prayer was important in at least one of the three, we'd see something of it. It's not there. It's not there. To many, the issue often seems too big a mess to sort out. Such individuals often yield to a subtle, blinding assumption that snares even many sincere, faithful, church-going individuals. They might never come out and actually say so. Underneath, they probably know better. But somehow they ignore or put off going through the study and work necessary to understand Bible salvation that they might enjoy the peace that comes from settling the matter. Hebrews 4.11 says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. It's not going to happen by accident. Why do they take such a risk? Because in the back of their minds... They are sincere, very sincere, and they feel sure that God knows how sincere they are. Their thought, God would never send someone to hell as sincere as I am, I'll be all right. In reality, of course, they are wrong. And to establish that fact, I want to begin by looking at three sincere men from the scriptures, three men who, though sincere, were sincerely wrong. My purpose in this message is to rattle the false security of anyone who thinks that sincerity has a chance of getting anyone to heaven. Point number one, three sincere men. And we'll look first of all at the, at the sincerity of Cain, the firstborn of Adam and Eve. Genesis 4 verses 1 through 5 read this way, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have begotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. 
And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Outside of the negative influence of federal farm programs and all the waste and corruption associated with them, can there be any more honest work than farming? I mean, tilling the ground, planting, weeding, and harvesting are real work. I've done just enough of it to appreciate farmers. I'm not one. Cain was involved in exactly those activities. He knew what it was to sweat. Uh, I, I, excuse me, perspire. Polite company. When he brought his offering of vegetables and fruits to the Lord after all that work, you can believe he sincerely wanted to please the Lord. He had a lot of himself invested in his offering. Abel, on the other hand, was a shepherd, which typically in Bible history meant that he spent his time moving his flocks from place to place, keeping them in good pasture. Such activity was time-consuming, but it typically did not demand as much constant physical work. Which offering did God respect? We just read it. He respected Abel's. Now, some emphasize that the issue was that Abel's offering was a blood sacrifice, whereas Cain's was not. Well, that's all true, but there was a more fundamental problem even than that. And you'll see it if you look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. Hebrews 11, 4 says, By faith, did you catch that? By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. As most of you know, Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Consequently, the only way that Abel could be said to have made his offering by faith was to have made it according to God's word or instruction. Though the instructions are not recorded in Genesis 4, Hebrews 11.4 proves that they were given. Don't forget our two-word Bible definition of faith derived from Romans 4. It is believing God. You got to know what he said in order to believe him, in order to exercise faith. In order to believe God, to exercise, exercise faith, we have to know what he said. That's why we need to spend time in our Bibles. No amount of sincerity on the part of Cain could make up for the fact that he did not follow God's instructions. Though he was sincere, he was wrong. Let's look at another one. Let's look at a fellow named Uzzah in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Now, to give a little background, the nation of Israel, through a series of events, had lost control of the Ark of the Covenant. It was very important to them. And uh, David had opportunity to recover it. And there was a lot of excitement. And uh, they took steps to sanctify the situation and the Lord and so forth. All sorts of good intentions. Sincerity. But there were problems. Let's read in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 2 through 8. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah and Uzzah and Ohio, that's not Ohio, Brother Chris, the sons of Abinadab drave the new cart and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab which was at Gibeah accompanying the ark of God and Ohio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord and all matter of instruments, 
excuse me, made of fir wood, even on harps and on saw trees and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perazuzzah to this day. Though David was troubled by this incident, he bears some responsibility in it. It was his presumably, um, or presumable, maybe is a better word, sincerity that led him to attempt to move the Ark of the Covenant in the cart, contrary to God's word. In Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 to 16, and chapter 30, verses 4 and 5, which are not on your sheets, I'm not going to turn there, the Lord gave specific instructions regarding the design of the ark and how it was to be transported. There were rings permanently mounted to its, its sides, which were, uh, through which, rather, were placed poles called staves by which it was to be carried. Moreover, in Deuteronomy 10.8, God said that the Levites were to carry it. It was not to be moved in a cart, not even in a new one. Though I believe Uzzah was unquestionably sincere when he grabbed the ark to stabilize it, he did so against the clear instruction of the word of God. Though he was sincere, he was wrong. And it cost him his life. Well, let's go to the New Testament. Let's look at the sincerity of Paul. We encounter the Apostle Paul first as Saul at the martyrdom of, St of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Stephen has just finished preaching his famous convicting message. The religious leaders who heard him hated him for that message. Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 54, we read... When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That's the account Later, Paul admits that he was consenting unto that execution. We find further revelations of his anti-Christian activities in such passages as Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went up unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, referring to Christians... If he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Paul later describes his motivation during those days in Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. These accounts of Saul, later to become the Apostle Paul, describe a sincere, exceedingly zealous man who was nevertheless wrong. 
He was but one of many fulfillers of the prophecy of the Lord found in John chapter 16 and verse 2, which says, Jesus speaking, They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. His sincerity was unquestionable. He was very much as he described others of his countrymen in Romans chapter 10, verses 2 and 3, zealous but not according to knowledge, and going about to establish his own righteousness. But though he was sincere, he was wrong. To further illustrate the limitation of sincerity, I want us to look at an application in our own setting. Point one was three sincere men. Point two, the limitations of sincerity applied to my favorite, no, this, I'm being facetious. I was about to say my favorite subject, but we'll just say applied to math. I'm an English major. English majors operate in one side of the brain, math majors in the other. I don't know which is which, but I know we rarely get together. We will this evening. Let's consider three math problems. Problem number one. How would you respond if you saw the problem written somewhere? Two plus two, some of you kids, help me out here. Two plus two equals five million written somewhere. You know how you would respond. Two plus two does not and never will equal five million. No matter how sincere we are when we add them. I know she could probably tell me. I know she could tell me. Some may say, and rightly so, that that is a ridiculous illustration. It is. But it is intended to contribute to a point which is not ridiculous. Let's look at another one. Problem two. What about two plus two equals... Five. It's so comparatively close. Surely we can get two plus two to equal five if we are really sincere when we add them. You suppose so? I'm being facetious again, obviously. No, once again, two plus two does not and never will equal five, no matter how sincere we are when we add them. By comparison, this proposed problem sounds far less ridiculous than the first one, but the principle is exactly the same. Sincerity does not and cannot overcome the fact that it is wrong. Problem number three. Problem number three. What about two plus two equals four? Am I right back there, little Battelle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. What happened? Am I still here? What did I do? <laughs> Am I on? I don't think I... I'll stay close here. Should we use this one? Okay, I'm back. Let's toss this third problem around a little bit. Let's imagine a first grade classroom setting. We have a room full of students, first graders now, who have never heard that two plus two equals four, and we have a teacher who is going to teach it to them. Let's hear what the teacher is saying. Children, I want you to know that if you are really sincere, when you add two plus two, the answer will be four. <laughs> In response to this, we ask, why did she say that? What does sincerity have to do with it? When you add two plus two, you get four. Period. And she can tell me that I'm right. 
When the teacher throws in the unnecessary concept of, of sincerity, we wind up with a lot of confused kids wandering around wondering if they are sincere enough to get the right answer. They start looking at themselves rather than at the facts. I will say that what the teacher said is true. Sincerely adding 2 plus 2 does yield 4. But why confuse the issue by unnecessarily adding the reference to sincerity? You can bet, we used to say that at West a lot, it might be a worldly expression, forgive me if, if you're offended. You can bet that the textbook never talked about being sincere. By the way, neither does the salvation textbook, the Bible. It never uses the word sincere in conjunction with the gospel of salvation of our soul. Ever. You can check it out. So let's talk about the limitations of sincerity applied to the gospel. Works do not save regardless of sincerity. You have a list of sample verses there, just a few of many, many, many we could use. Acts 13, 39, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Romans 4, 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we kind of looked at that early, earlier, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Thus, trying to get to heaven by way of works is very much like trying to come up with 5 million by adding 2 plus 2. It's clearly that ridiculous. And just as with the math problem, applying sincerity makes no difference. Sinners' prayers and asking the Lord Jesus into one's heart do not save. Probably most here don't believe that they do anyway. The Bible does not teach these. They are just so many more works. Again, as with a math illustration, telling someone to pray a sinner's prayer sincerely does not change the fact that it does not save, even if you add confessing all your sins, which would be virtually impossible to do anyway. Such a prayer looks and sounds so reasonable, but it perhaps compares to trying to come up with five by adding two plus two. It's still wrong. Sincerity doesn't change a thing. All right, believing. Believing. We saw that works don't save. We saw that sinners' prayers don't save. Believing, trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ does save. Ephesians 1.13, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. John 3.16, we looked at it earlier. John 3.18, I got a whole message on John 3.18. Not tonight. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, and in case you didn't get it the first time, he comes back at it again. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Acts 16, 30 and 31. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That was the Philippian jailer speaking to Paul and his company. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And many more passages. You could name several, I'm sure. As with the correct problem, the correct math problem, wherein 2 plus 2 equals 4, why add the qualifier sincere? Either one believes or he does not. Either one trusts or he does not. 
The Bible nowhere adds the term sincere as a qualifier in the matter of salvation. Why do so many people do so? I'm sure the motive is to avoid causing someone to make a hurried, shallow, empty profession. But this concern is misplaced or possibly even reflects a total misunderstanding of the role of the believer in witnessing for Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 3 for just a minute, beginning at about verse 6. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 9 say, read this way, I have planted, Paul speaking, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. That's his business. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every one shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God. Wow, what a concept. What a concept. The job of the witness is to sow and water the seed, the word of God, not manipulate a person into making a profession of faith, not even a sincere one. God gives the increase. Either a person believes the word or he does not. Either he trusts or he does not. There are not degrees of belief as inclusion of the term sincere implies. There is not a scale, unlike school, unlike my classes, unlike college classes, there is not a scale of zero to a hundred wherein all who believe at 70% or higher make it and 69% and below fail and go to hell. It's a one question test. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your savior? Meaning trusted the sufficiency of his death at Calvary to meet your need. If you have, you pass 100%. If you have not, you fail 0%. Adding a prayer, even a sincere one, doesn't change anything. The problem with adding the qualifier sincere is that people wind up wondering about whether or not they are sincere enough rather than focusing on the facts. I love dealing with facts. The fact that Jesus Christ has already paid their sin debt in full. God is, present tense, satisfied. The question, once again, is simply, have you trusted the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary as your only hope of, of, of heaven? God said in Isaiah 53, 11, hundreds of years before the event happened, that he would be satisfied with Christ's payment for our sins at Calvary. In John chapter 19 and verse 30, Jesus, speaking from the cross, said, and we've heard this already this week, it is finished. Isaiah 53, 11 was fulfilled. God was indeed satisfied. Salvation occurs when you become satisfied with what satisfied God, Christ's finished work. That satisfaction is not affected by our sincerity. We just need to take God at his word and put our trust in the sufficiency of what Jesus accomplished for us at Calvary. Amen. Pastor.